This is Apps Gaming. Jap has decided to reveal details to the press. The alphabet murder is now famous. It is not a bad idea. The more people who know, the greater our chances of finding out something of interest. Poirot, I have a bad feeling. Welcome back to the ABC murders, and it seems like we've got some more post. So let's go and have a look. Poor Mr. Poirot, not so good at these little criminal matters as you thought yourself, are you? Rather past your prime, perhaps. Let us see if you can do any better this time. This time, it's an easy one. Churston on the 30th. Do try and do something about it. It's a bit dull having it all my own way, you know. Good hunting. Ever yours, ABC. Good hunting. Did you hear that, Poirot? The murderer seems to be taking it all as a game, a challenge. He will strike on 30th in Churston. We must warn Scotland Yard. No time to lose. We must prepare our suitcases for Churston. Mon Dieu, it is already 10 o'clock. I will call Scotland Yard immediately. Hello, Jap. We received a new letter from ABC in the 10 o'clock post. Where and when? In Churston. Today. Today? I'll inform the population immediately. I'll check the train times. Call me back. As we inspect the envelope, we learn that the address that is wrote on it is wrong. Could this have been the cause for the delay? It probably was. The letter should have arrived in time. The postmark shows that it was sent three days ago. However, our man made a mistake in the address, which explains the delay. All the same, the post office took their time correcting the error. Come on, Poirot. Your address is not quite as well known as that of Scotland Yard. I have some news from Churchton. Bad news, I'm afraid. Sir Carmichael Clark was murdered while out on his evening walk. Sir Carmichael Clark. The name is familiar to me. He was a famous throat specialist, one of the best in London. A wealthy man. He retired to Combeside, a beautiful house by the sea. He collected antiques. Are you going there? Yes, let's meet on the train. So now it's our turn to go to Churston. The victim is called Sir Carmichael Clark, one of the best throat specialists in London. The body was still warm when we found it. If we had been warned earlier, we definitely could have saved him. It appears that the murderer made a mistake when he wrote his letter. A mistake? Lucky for him. And what if he did it on purpose? No, no. He's defined his madcap rules and he's sticking to them. It's a matter of pride for him. Shall we go up to the house, Poro? You go, my friends. I will come soon. So we're going to quickly investigate the area and see if we can find any more clues. Sir Carmichael's throat was cut. It's a clean incision, a professional murder. An ABC guide, the murderer's customary signature, covered in blood this time. Apart from the wound to the throat, the body is untouched. No cuts, no bruises. The gravel on the path has been sprayed with blood that covers a conical-shaped area, which starts at the body and becomes wider as it moves further from the bush. Jap has emptied the victim's pockets and has laid out their contents on this piece of wax cloth. It is pointless. An oriental dragon. It's an old piece, much older than the pocket watch on which it was fastened. A signet ring, very probably with the Clark family's coat of arms. Nothing appears to be missing from this wallet. This place is very calming. As we keep investigating, we do have an observation of the scenery right here. The site is exceptional. It is easy to imagine that Sir Carmichael used to enjoy stopping here every evening. The body is just in front of a bush, one of the only bushes in the surrounding area. 
Sir Carmichael had his back to the bush when the killer cut his throat from behind. A fatal blow that sprayed blood over a range of more than one meter. Have you finished, Poirot? Chief Inspector, many questions remain unanswered, but I am certain of one thing. The killer has prepared his crime very carefully. Quite right. He must have known Sir Carmichael's movements well to plan such an attack. The murderer struck with terrible savagery. Yes, blood flowed. It's the first time he's attacked a man. He armed himself accordingly. Have you spoken to the victim's family, Chief Inspector? I've spoken to the brother, Franklin Clark. I didn't get much out of him. He's yours. I must get the body removed. Let's go inside now and do a bit more investigating. I'm sure there's lots more to be found. To be honest, this inspector seems rather obtuse. I'm counting on your friend Poirot to catch my brother's murderer. Ah, here he is now. Please, Mr. Poirot. Mr. Poirot, this is my brother's secretary, Miss Thora Gray. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Poirot. Would you like some tea? No, thank you, mademoiselle. I find it hard to digest. There is something elegant about her. One key thing that points out to us about this lady is her brooch, and we'll probably ask some questions later. She has good taste, except perhaps in her choice of jewellery. Please excuse me, I have to take care of Lady Clark. Someone set a trap for your brother. Who was familiar with his habits? Everybody knew he took his evening walk at half past eight, and that he always followed the same path. Now we're going to ask some questions to the brother. And uh, did people of the village know Sir Carmichael's habits? I don't know. It's possible. What were you doing last night? After dinner, I went to my bedroom. At 11 in the evening, the telephone rang. It was the police. I went to look for my brother. Was it a dark night? It was a new moon. I took a lantern. So it was you who found the body? Yes, along with the gardener. Have you seen any strangers around the house recently? No. As far as I know, nobody has been near the house. Miss Clark. Oh, Lady Clark must have fallen from her chair. I have to help Miss Gray get her up. Hastings, while our host is gone, let's examine the drawing room. But, Poirot, a gentleman shouldn't... I take full responsibility. All you have to do is to leave the drawing room door ajar and let me know if anyone is coming. Now that we're on our own, we're going to do a bit of investigating. First, we look at the table and notice there are four different symbols on there. One of them being the dragon. Once we've got these symbols down, we're going to go over to the cabinet and look at the cabinet. There is exactly the same symbols on top of it. We need to match these symbols to the table to unlock the bottom drawer. I think I heard a bang. Could it be this cupboard? This is interesting. Ernest Luggan, MD Brighton Cancer Institute, 201 Dusk Road, Brighton, Sussex. To Sir Carmichael Clark, MD Comsite, Chester, Devon. Brighton, 1935, January the 5th. As a man of science, I owe it to you to be completely frank. Lady Clark, your wife is suffering from a generalized terminal cancer. I confess I didn't suspect anything like that during the first exams. But with the test results I have received today, there is unfortunately no place for doubt. I estimate that Lady Clark's life expectancy is no more than one year. Hospitalization would not help in her case, so I advise you to keep her at home and provide her with as much morphine as required to ease her last moments. Yours sincerely, Ernest Logan. Here's Miss Gray. Sorry to keep you waiting. Lady Clark's condition requires regular care. I believe you want to ask me a few questions. Indeed, mademoiselle. She appears to be very flustered. 
And Poirot loves to observe people, especially a couple of times before and after. And that's what he's doing now. He's observing this lady one more time before he can ask her some more questions. She's unable to hide her emotion, and her makeup has been disturbed. I think that this young woman has just been kissed. You have a good knowledge of art history. Acquired while working with Sir Carmichael. I used to help him manage his collection and choose his new acquisitions. And sometimes he used to give you a piece as a gift, is that right? Gift? What do you mean? I am referring to your brooch. This old brooch? Mademoiselle, you know perfectly well. I am talking about the magnificent brooch you were wearing earlier. Yes, you're right. Sir Carmichael did give it to me. He valued my work. How could I refuse? He would have been offended. You took it off because of Lady Clark, am I right? Indeed. Lady Clark does not like this jewel. Why upset someone who is so gravely ill? I see. This jewel is sinister, do you not think? A black dragon. No man of death. It is not surprising that it frightens Lady Clark. Oh no, I don't think so. The Chinese dragon is not destructive. It's a positive symbol. Have you seen any strangers hanging around in the past few days? No. Nobody has been near Comside. What were you doing yesterday evening at the time of the murder? I was sleeping. I was woken by the telephone at 11. I heard Franklin Clark speaking with the gardener. They left with some lanterns and they found the body. What are your feelings about Franklin Clark? What an odd question. Of course I think he's a good man. He's energetic, nice, very sociable. Miss Gray, if I may be so bold, please do not take offence. My friend has rather unusual methods, but all he wants is to find the murderer. Yes, I understand. I must rest. Please excuse me. Earlier, you asked me to watch the living room door for you. I don't wish to be indiscreet, but sometimes a gentleman stumbles upon a secret without intending to. That is sometimes the case. And I saw Franklin Clark kissing Miss Gray at the foot of the stairs. Do you think this is a common occurrence? No, I saw emotion, intensity. I think it was their first kiss. Well done, mon ami. Well spotted. However, I don't think I completely understand this business. Why did Sir Carmichael not defend himself? He appeared to have been active and strong. The murderer did not give him a chance. Let us try and reconstruct the scene. So now we're going to do the reconstruction. Sir Clark is taking his customary walk. Our killer is hiding behind a bush. The old man walks quietly along the gravel path. Then he turns towards the sea to gaze at it. The killer leaves his hiding place on the right-hand side. He approaches silently over the grass. Then he throws himself on his prey and cuts the poor man's throat. He then lays down the ABC before leaving. Everything appears to match the crime scene, mon cher Hastings. That is exactly what happened. And now we find ourselves looking at an ABC. And if you remember the first episode, well, you'll remember this guy. Oh, just a minute. I'm getting dressed. Mr. Kirst, have you recently returned from Churston? Uh, 
Yes, yes, indeed I have. Have you seen the papers? And to think that you might have rubbed shoulders with the killer. Imagine that. Mr. Cast, are you all right? You don't seem well. My apologies. My throat is burning. And my head feels heavy. It's ever since the war, you know. Since my injury, my head has never been the same. And there's a bottle on the right. Maybe we'll find out about that in the future. Poirot, it's a pleasure to be with you again after all these years. I looked for a gift to thank you, and I found this propelling pencil. An authentic collector's item. You spoil me, mon ami. And you more so by sharing investigations. Do not underestimate the help you are to me as things. Intellect is not everything. There is also goodwill, and you are not short of that. Later, I will ask you to help me tidy up the room and bring some chairs. Our guest will be here soon. Ah, is Thora Grey coming? Naturally. She is a fascinating young woman, n'est-ce pas? Oh, come on, Poirot. I'm a married man. But Miss Grey has already been courted by Franklin Clark. Poirot, our guests will be here soon. We must prepare ourselves. And as you can see, all the people we've met so far have arrived. I wish to thank you all for coming. I wanted to bring everyone close to the victims here in order to unmask the murderer. Get to the point, Mr. Poirot. What do you want from us? Megan, dear girl, please be patient. Mr. Poirot, how dare you address me by my first name? Please excuse me, mademoiselle. What I ask is that you search your memories. The murderer must have left some trace. Yes, he must have prepared his crimes very carefully. Tout à fait. He did not get to Bexhill at midnight in order to strangle a young girl whose name by chance starts with P. Must we go into that? No, of course. Not if it makes you uncomfortable. Come on, Mr. Poirot. I imagine we all feel terribly uncomfortable about these murders. It's true. We've to catch the killer, not be spared the gory details. Mr. Fraser, please get a grip on yourself. Well, I want to help you, but... I don't remember anything else. Nothing I haven't already said. And you, Mademoiselle Barnard? Did your sister say if she was seeing another man? She never would have told me. Allons, surely sisters have no secrets. She never spoke about any of that to me. Do you believe me or do I have to repeat myself? Betty knew I didn't approve of her behavior. Her flirting was spoiling any chance she might have had. Tell me, mademoiselle, what did you talk about with your sister? Silly things. Her new dress. She wanted a pair of black stockings to go with it. Mother bought her a brand new pair. The day it happened, she was crying. And to think that Betty never even wore them. Oh, poor mummy. Your sister used to sing, I believe. Did she ever perform in public? She dreamt about it, but she had a very bad cough. It troubled her greatly. She had to cancel auditions and miss lots of opportunities. A pity. Yes, she sang well, but that doesn't tell us much about the murderer. Qui sait? In any case, we now have enough information to draw up a relatively precise psychological profile. So, ladies and gentlemen, we can now surmise without too much risk of error that our adversary is calculative, sure of himself, a seducer of outstanding intelligence, that he has plenty of self-control and that he likes railways. It's a good start. Other meetings may be necessary. I hope that you will be able to come back again. Well, it's just that... <sighs> well, Mademoiselle Drawer, do you wish to help us or not? Oh, Mr. Poirot, don't be so harsh. It's normal that people helping with this inquiry should be reimbursed. Starting with you, Miss Drawer, please allow me to pay for your train tickets. Oh, sir, I cannot accept. But you must. Mademoiselle, I may not be rich, but my brother left a fortune which will be mine. Mr. Clark, that's very generous of you. Well, someone has to foot the bill. Mr. Poirot, would it be possible for you to come back to Devon? Lady Clark has expressed a wish to see you. We'll adjust her medicine so she'll not be too drowsy. 
But of course, I shall come the day after tomorrow if it is convenient. Thank you all for coming. We will meet again soon. The meeting was most fruitful. Really? Hastings, I believe now we have everything we need to find a common point between the victims. Now it is time for us to use our grey matter. The first two victims suffered from bad throats, and that was precisely the speciality of the third victim, Dr. Clark. We have a lead. It would pay to take a closer look at the medical records of Dr. Clark's patients. We'll do so during our next visit to Churston. I will do it myself, mon ami. You must remain in London just in case ABC sends us another letter. Very well, as you wish. Well, we're back in Churston and as this lady is going away, we do meet the brother gonna leave it here today guys thank you very much for joining us yet again on this part three of the agatha christie's abc murders i will be back very very soon with the part four and i can't wait to find out what more information we uncover until then guys have a great rest of your day and it is peace out from me